after that um, intro, it wasn't even to Haggai. I want to pray. We're in Haggai tonight. Let's open our Bibles up to the book of Haggai. It's only two chapters. That's why I knew I had a little bit more time to share. I didn't know I would share that long, but most pastors never do anyway. I don't know how long they're going to share. Um, but as you guys are finding your way to Haggai, it's the last minor prophet. You have Haggai, Zechariah, and then you get into the uh, uh, Malachi. Uh, it's the second to last, I guess, minor prophet. Uh, and then you'll get into Matthew. So just a few books back, about three books back. If you go to Matthew, and go back to your left, about three books. Again, um, I think that's, um, what is that? I was going to use a joke, and it doesn't show me what page it is. I'm sorry. Can't use my joke. Anyway, you'll find it. There's prophetic and there's pathetic. The first was prophetic. This was pathetic. Let's pray. Lord, we pray right now for the nation of Israel. We pray right now for the Jews. And we ask your mercy on them. Again, not just in their practical needs right now in facing battle. But Lord, we see a move of Satan against the nation right now. You promised you're going to take care of them. You promised in the last days you would pour your spirit out on them and you would save them. There's going to be multitudes of them being saved. Right now they're not family, but they will be. Satan knows that. That's why he hates them. That's why he's attacking. I pray for the church. Lord, I know that we're going to be next. We're already in the mix, and, and it's, it won't be long until they're going to be marching on the campuses about hating Christians as well. It's, it's, Lord, it's following the same pattern that Satan does and has done throughout history. So we know it. Thank you for giving us a heads up. Now, God, I pray you'd make us bold. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and give us boldness. Let us transfer that feeling of fear and grab a hold of it and strangle that fear and turn it into boldness. And God, I thank you that you not only will do that by your spirit, but you've given us even physiologically the way you've designed us to do that. I thank you for that. I know that many that go into battle need that. For everyone's afraid going into physical battle. And they need that fear to turn into boldness so that they can fight for their family and their nation. But Lord, we need, the same, we need the same thing in the spirit. We need to be able to strangle the fear and to fight boldly for the family of God and for our future family in the Jewish nation. So let us not be silent like so many of the churches in the days of Hitler. Let us not be silent now as we see the same move, God. Let us be vocal. Let us make a stand. And Lord, in whatever consequences come our way, Lord, we know there's going to be great reward. And we know that with the boldness, there'll be joy. And we know that we will never be left alone. You will press in. And you will do in us what needs to be done to be your witnesses. And, and Lord, when we stand before you on that day, what joy. What joy we're going to have to know that we didn't shrink back. We weren't like those who shrunk back, but we were like those who stepped forward in boldness for your namesake. Father, I thank you, Lord, for Haggai. I thank you for the boldness you gave him, God, in this very short but powerful uh, prophecy as he was used as a great motivator for the nation of Israel. And I pray, God, now that you just open up Haggai to us. You would be our teacher, teach us from the book of Haggai. And again, Lord, uh, minister what you plan on ministering through the book of Haggai for us tonight. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we get into the book of Haggai, we're almost done with the minor prophets. We have Haggai, which is a minor prophet. Then we're going to have next week, Zechariah, which is a major prophet. And then we go back to a minor prophet in Malachi, and then we're going to get into the New Testament. Now, what is the difference in the major and the minor prophets? It's not that one's more important than the other. Uh, you know, our mindset is, oh, that's the minor leagues, right? These are the majors. That's how our mind works because of our culture. No, all that, all, the only reason they're classified that way is the size of the prophecy. Okay, you look at the ones, they're big. Ezekiel's big, that's major. Isaiah's big, that's major. Zechariah's big, that's major. And then these, these ones like Habakkuk and Haggai, they a couple of chapters or whatever, two or three chapters, Zephaniah, two, three chapters. These are minor prophets. And Malachi, you know, four or whatever, they're minor prophets. So um, that's what that means. And this is now gonna be a, a minor prophet here. A little bit of background about Haggai. We don't know a lot about him. Um, he was very short and to the point. I mean, he just, God gave him what he had to say and he said it, but he was a great motivator. He'd be kind of like a, a, a Barnabas today. He was great mo in motivating the nation to get going and they needed to be motivated. The setting here, um, you know, is, is the nation has come back now from Babylon. They're coming back to the land. They've been out of the land for 70 years. They're rebuilding their temple. And so they need to be motivated to rebuild it. There's a lot of reasons not to be motivated. We're going to see that when they go back, understandably so, because of our human nature, they're focused on themselves too much. They're focused on their own houses, their own belongings. And to a degree, you can say, I understand to a degree on the human level because they're moving back to a place that's been decimated. They've got to start over. You've got to build a home. You've got to start over, whatever. 
The problem was they were saying, well, it's not time to work on the church. It's not time to work on the temple and, and the work of God. So right now we just need to build our own houses and do our own thing and you'll get everything going. And they let it go so long that what's happening is, is now they're, they're really kind of neglecting God. That's going to be the setting for this. And God's going to challenge them and say, consider your ways. What are you doing? Yeah, your house, you need to be a good steward of the things that I've given you. But who gave them to you? Well, you did, God. Well, then which is more important, me or your house? Well, you are, God. Okay, let's get, re let's get refocused. And I think that's a good thing for us. Basically, it's priorities. What are our priorities? Are our priorities the Lord or our priorities, what we want to do, and our future, and our goals, and our dreams. Look, God gives us dreams, and God gives gifts, and God wants you to be blessed, and all that. It's not that God doesn't. He's the one that gave all that, right? If you have some ability that you want to try to use in some way, God gave it to you, okay? So God's not against that, but we have to make sure that God is first, and that he doesn't fall into second place, or, or even farther down the line. God is not just an, something we add on to our life. He should be our life, and then we use the gifts that he's given to, to, to do what he's called us to do. And he gives us joy in that. And we use it to glorify his kingdom. So that's kind of the idea of, of what the book of Haggai is about. Uh, Haggai means festive, which is, is in one way you think festive. He's kind of rebuking them for being lazy in the things of God. But really, it, it is, it, his name is very fitting because we're going to see that when he motivates them, they respond beautifully. You know, sometimes you can motivate people and say, come on now, guys, let's get going. And they just kind of sit there and go, okay, somebody else will get going, but thanks for saying that. I won't, I'll let somebody else get going. But I'll be back next week, right? They weren't that way. They were saying, yeah, it's gonna be me. I'm gonna step up, I'm gonna get going. I'm gonna just whatever God's called me to do, I'm gonna do it. And they responded, well, that creates a festive atmosphere. That, that is festive in the sense of, you know what? We're serving God, God can pour out his spirit, God can refresh uh, and begin to work again. Um, and so his name is fitting. Uh, they have come back now and really been there uh, a while. It's been about, they, they laid a foundation for the new temple about 16 years earlier. So it's, it's, it's a little later when they've come back here. But they've laid a foundation. And for about 16 years, they kind of just, they, it didn't go good. They got the foundation, started laying the foundation, or started working on it, rather. They started, we're going to finish the foundation. But they started working on it and, and getting it laid. And they kind of just kind of faded, right? They, they didn't have the resources they needed. They said, and, and they're going to start saying, now's not the time. This isn't the time to work. And guys, here's going to be another main message of this. Look, if God is calling us to do something individually or as a church, it's always the time. Okay? Now, I understand when you come to look at something, is this time to take a loan for a new home or to make an investment and what's the market? That's called wisdom. You're looking. There's nothing wrong in being a good steward, looking at things. But when God says move forward, it doesn't matter what the, what the interest rate is. Now, again, if you know it's going to drop in two months, maybe you wait a couple months, but whatever, but the point is, it doesn't matter. God's not concerned about the interest rates or, or what the, some, if God says do it, our job is, in, is to be faithful and step forward and do it, okay? I'm not talking to be, about being foolish. I'm talking about once we use our earthly means that we have, listening to the Spirit of God. And so um, the Proverbs rebukes us for saying, you know what, I can't do it now. There's a lion in the streets. There's a lion in the streets. And the point he's making is it's kind of a rather dramatic example saying, there's always some problem that's so fearful I can't do anything for God right now. I want to serve right now, but uh, I'm not ready. Or I need to do this first or whatever. God says, stop saying there's a lion in the streets. Just step out and do what I've called you to do. I'll take care of the lions. I'll make you a lion. You're going to be the lion. You're not going to be afraid of them. You're going to be the lion. And so that's kind of the, the heart of what Haggai is. Let's just jump in. Um, the setting here is 520 BC, August 24th is where this first chapter starts. And it says, in the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came, and by the way, these are, uh, we'll get to the August 24th. The word is going to come to him. And remember, we're using a Jewish calendar, not our normal calendar. Some of these don't line up in your brain. Um, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, this people says the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Now, two things quickly. We're going to see next week, we'll see Zerubbabel is the one that God used to build this temple again, to restore the temple that had been torn down. Um, 
And again, uh, 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 Joshua, the high priest, we'll see him again next week. So he's, he's prophesying during the days of Ezra and during the days, obviously, of, of Zerubbabel and, and, and um, you know, uh, the book of Zechariah that we'll get to next week. So you have kind of the timestamp on it. He gives some very specific dates here, which is very interesting in this, um, just because, again, it's going to tell us by the end of the chapter, you know, it's August 24th of 520, very specific days, and he does that. And that's another thing I want to point out about prophecy. Prophecy of God is very specific. Recognize that. If somebody says, thus saith the Lord, um, and you, sometimes you see this in, in groups where people want to be prophesying, and you wonder, maybe they're just speaking a word of encouragement or, or whatever. And, and I believe in the gifts. I, believe that, I don't believe there's prophets still today, because Jesus said the last prophet was John the Baptist. He said the prophets were until John. So we know that John was identified as the last official prophet. However, that doesn't mean there's not a gift of prophecy. It's one of the gifts. So I do believe people today still prophesy, some foretelling, some foretelling, but not in the sense of the office of a prophet. Uh, but at the same time, whenever it's truly a prophecy of God, it's going to be specific because God doesn't just kind of guess and say things generically. And sometimes I hear these things where people will say, you know, my children, uh, sometime over the next, you know, whatever, five years, you're going to whatever, and you're, you know, you're going to, and then this will happen, and a garden will grow better, and okay, but what are you saying, Right? And I think sometimes, and I think sometimes people really are maybe, even in those instances, some, some people are just wanting to look spiritual. But I think in those instances, some people really are maybe speaking for the Lord, but they think it's a gift of prophecy, and it's not. They don't know how to identify the gifts. It might be a, a, or just a word of encouragement um, or whatever the case might be. So oftentimes, you know, when, when you'll see some of the gifts operate, I've been in certain situations where someone will speak in another language. I've heard that happen in, where people are operating in the gifts. And then somebody will stand up and say something like, you know, um, my children, you know, you're going to, you know, within six months, your whole life's going to get better or whatever. Well, you automatically know that's not the interpretation. And how do you know that? Because when you read in Corinthians, it says that whenever you're speaking in a, another language, it is always speaking praises to God. So unless it's praises to God, that wasn't the right interpretation. And it'll be something about his holiness or his righteousness. That's when you know it's a true interpretation of, of another language, okay? So, but when that happens, it doesn't mean that the person giving the interpretation of, of what they thought it was, it doesn't mean they're faking it. It doesn't mean they're trying to look spiritual and trying to look important to get up to say something. No, it may be they just got a word of knowledge. It may be they just got a word of wisdom. It may be they just got a word of encouragement. It may be any of number of the other gifts operating, but they didn't know how to identify it. So, um, you know, never be afraid to do that if God's putting something on your heart. And again, if you've got somebody who understands the gifts, they'll be able to say, well, no, that wasn't the interpretation. However, that was a word of encouragement for someone. So somebody needs to receive that or whatever. And then you begin to learn how the gifts operate. But you're going to see here with prophecy. When it's prophecy, it's, it's very specific. I remember um, it's only happened a couple times in my life. I'll share with you guys. One of them uh, where it was very specific with, with me was, you know, before Tracy and I were married, um, she had gone back into the mission field overseas, um, and I knew I was, we were supposed to get married. And so she, in rebellion, uh, left and went <laughs> to Cyprus and the Middle East and, and, and Egypt and all that. And God told me. I, I, don't, I forget what month she went back. But God told me she's coming back in January. It was that specific. I knew it was the Lord. And she said, well, um, you know, I, I'm going back for a couple years because I'm committed uh, to YWAM for a couple more years. Then when I get back, we'll talk and pray about, you know, if God's bringing us back together and all that. And I said, you'll be back in January. She said, no, no, no. I won't be back in January because I've, commit, I've made a two-year commitment. I said, you're going to be back. Um, I said, you'll see. And so she had made a pact with our pastor at that time that if anything happened, you know, that was dangerous and he wanted her to respond, that she'd come back. She said, okay, if you tell me I need to, then I'll take that from the Lord, et cetera. So after she goes, the Gulf War broke out, right? And it's like, you don't need to start a war, Lord, to get her back. Um, <laughs> just a word of knowledge, you know, probably work. But either way, the war broke out. He didn't know anything about what I'd said. He didn't know about what he just said. You know what? This is, it's right there in the Gulf. She's over there. He felt responsible for her. She's a single young girl. And so he said, you know what? You've got to come home. She's like, you're kidding. I said, no, you've got to come home. And so it was like at the very, you know, 1st of January or whatever, I think when she said that, when he said that, end of November, 1st of January. And so, you know, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't, any you told, you know, it wasn't like I told you. It was just like, well, I knew it. Right? And so, 
so she had this real hard struggle. She couldn't get a flight back because of the war and getting, um, and it just wasn't working, you know. And we're getting down to like the last week of January. I mean, and like, and she's like, you know, I don't know that I'm going to make it back by January. I said, yeah, you will. She landed January 29th at Albuquerque Airport. And I was like, I told you, I don't know why you went over there. And I didn't say that, but <laughs> because we were supposed to get married. So that's how prophecy works. If God gives a word of prophecy or a specific, it's very detailed. And so here, again, note this. He's saying it was on this day. It was at this moment that it happened. And, um, and he's saying, and here's what they were saying. Notice this. The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. They're saying, look, this isn't the time. We, we need to build our own houses. We, we need to take care of our, our things at home first. There's things that need to be fixed. I've got to get that deck out back. I've got to whatever, blah, blah, blah. And there's nothing wrong in getting the deck out back fixed and all. Here's my point. God is saying, look, don't put me second. Don't put me second. You've got to put me first. I remember, you know, when I, you know, got saved, I was playing, playing, playing music in the clubs. It's like storytelling night for Mark. What is going on? I'm going to trust God. I don't usually do this that much, but I was playing in the clubs. I got saved, and that was my life. And right when I got saved, again, it's one of those times you hear God's voice really clear. You know, not, not, not audible, but you know how you hear it as a believer. He said, put your guitar down. Don't play it. I'm like, really? But I knew it was him. It was so clear. So I put it down, and I realized after a while of not playing it, it, was, it didn't play for about six months. I remember putting it down. It was like, you know what? That's, that's been what your focus has been. And now, now you're born again. You have a new focus, Mark. It's me. And I was like, well, I, I love you way better. You know, I mean, music is cool, but nothing's like Jesus. And once it was really established that he was on the throne, about six months later, I heard that same prompting. Okay, play again. But this time do it for me. And so for years and years and years, I just led worship. And I think for the first probably 15 years of this church, I led worship. It's funny, sometimes, you know, I've, I haven't done anything here recently in a while. Uh, but I, I was a while back, you do something, and the people that didn't even know, I was like, I didn't even know you could play, you know, whatever. I'm not that good. I'm just a chord guy. I can't, you know, all this stuff these guys do. It's like, you know, that's what I can do. <laughs> but God gave me enough to be able to lead the body for the years of establishing the church. You know, so I'm thankful for that. And I'm also thankful that I wasn't good enough to make it. Praise the Lord that I was not good. Thank you. I appreciate that tearing down acknowledgement. Thank you very much. But I mean it. I thank the Lord that I wasn't that good. Because you know what? It's intoxicating when people think you're great. And, and the more drinks they had, the greater they thought I was. Like they play the first song, like, eh. You get halfway through that other, that guy's great. <laughs> Nothing has changed. You're just out of your mind. And I'm not making light of drunkenness. I'm just saying that's the reality of if you've, those have come out of the clubs or been involved in that scene, you know what that's like. But I've, I've thanked the Lord numerous times saying, thank you, God, that I wasn't good enough to make it because I wonder if I had been, where would I be today? Would I be dead or would I be, you know, letting the world, you know, love you and then you never come to Christ? And, and, and the world goes, one of the greatest of ever, whatever, and you go to hell. And you're sitting there going, if I could go back, I'd throw that guitar over a cliff. I'd never sing a note. I just want Jesus. And so, anyway, he says, look, you're, you're, you're putting yourself first. It's not time. Don't do it. Interest rates aren't good. Things are hard. Whatever. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet saying, it is time. For you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses, or rather, I'm sorry, is it time for you to dwell in your paneled houses and the temple lies in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord. Here it is. Consider your ways. That's a great encouragement tonight for us, isn't it, guys? Consider our ways. What are our ways tonight? What are your ways tonight? Are your ways all about you, about what you're wanting? Then your ways are wrong. They're just wrong. Um, I'm too old to worry about offending you guys anymore. I love you, but I'm going to speak the truth. If those are your ways, they're wrong. You need to repent and get right ways. And he says here, look what you're doing. You got to consider, consider, think about where you are in life. And all of us tonight, we should do that. Consider, where am I? Where's my focus? What am I doing? It doesn't mean you don't finish your house that you're building. It doesn't mean you don't do a good job. But is your house and your job and other things taking most of your life with just kind of fragments left over for the Lord? Probably not you or you wouldn't be here on Wednesday night. 
But either way, um, a lot of people are in that place. And, and I love this. This is it. Just you need to do it. We're going to see they respond. I love their hearts because, again, a lot of times people don't respond. These guys were ready to respond. Look what God says to them. And God now speaks, you've sown much and bring in little. You eat but do not have enough. You drink but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves but no one is warm. And he who earns wages earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Doesn't that feel like it sometimes? What he's saying is, I don't care how hard you work. If, you're not, if you've not got me first, you're not honoring me, I can't bless that. I can't bless it. But if you honor me, I will bless it. And this is where the real challenge of, and this is not a teaching about tithing. As you guys know, we've never taken up an offering. We never will. That's between you and the Lord. But I would be neglecting my duties not to teach on it when it comes up. But the point is, is that this is the real challenge for every believer in Christ. Because God is going to put you in a place where you're going to think, I can't tithe. Things are too tight. And God's going to find out, really? Really? So I'm not God Almighty. So I, I, I don't have the ability to do what needs to be done. So you can't give to me because things are tight. He's saying, you don't understand. In Malachi, we'll see, he says, because things are tight, you need all the more to be giving to me. Because that's when I'm going to do a miracle that's not only going to supply for your needs, it's going to blow your mind and you're going to grow in faith. Another Mark story. <laughs> I had no idea this night would be this way. Baby Christian, working, waiting tables, Living in an apartment with, for, I don't know if I had no furniture at that time or not, but for a while I had no furniture. I just, you know, come home and, you know, get a, whatever I could, can of beans or whatever and sit on the floor and, and you know, I ended up getting a couch, you know, one of these things you buy. Or some guy looks like he made it, I bought it at a furniture store, but it looked like some guy made it in his garage. So it was like two by fours, stain them and just throw some terrible cushions on it. You sit down, they go under the wood and your back's hurting, you know, anyway. But I was the happiest I've ever been because I'd been rescued from drugs and alcohol. I was filled with the joy of the Lord. I was like, I don't care about this. <laughs> Who cares, right? And it was like, you know, um, I started hearing about tithing. What is that? Well, you, you know, you give God the first fruits. You know, did, tomorrow's the day of first fruits. Did you know that? And that's what they would do is when their crop would come in, they'd, give, they'd cut the first part of the crop and they'd take it to the priest and give it to him and they'd wave it uh, before the Lord. And it was basically saying, God, I'm giving you the first because I realize it all came from you anyway. So I'm giving, I'm giving you the first. And so I began to hear this and say, you need to give God the first. And I'd, look, I'd go, wait a minute, I only make this much money. I mean, I, 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 again, I don't want to over-dramatize the story. I think that was when I didn't have furniture. If I did have furniture, then forgive me. But I certainly wasn't doing great. But I remember saying, okay, what well, I'm supposed to be giving to God. What is it, you know? And of course, all you understand is 10%, whatever. You don't even think about that kind of thing. You know, it's not even about the percentage. It's your heart before God. It's a whole different teaching. But I didn't really... I didn't have the money to do it. And I, but I, God had given me great faith as a baby Christian. I, sometimes I think I had more then than I do now. Because I'd come out of that world, I'd watch God rescue me out of that world and set me free. So it's like, God could do anything. You know how that is? You just believe everything. It's almost like that childlike faith. And you start getting old, older and the Lord starts thinking too much. And then faith becomes hard again. But I was in that faith is easy phase. I was like, all right, I don't have any money, but there it is, the first to God. Now, what am I going to do? How am I going to do this? I, I kid you not, I came home from church after doing that, and God, again, in my heart, said, you know, call the bank, see what you got in there. And I had just emptied it down to $5 that week. I took everything out but $5 because I didn't want to close my account. So I, I had done that. I did it myself. I knew what it was. It was $5. And then I gave God the first, and I had whatever I could, whatever, you know, can of beans or whatever I was going to do. And so I, 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 it's clear as day. He's like, call the bank. Check your account. I said, well, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, that's probably me. I know what my account is. It's $5. I just cleared it out. But I'll, I'll do it. I'll call the bank. I called the bank, and I said, could you check my account and see what I have in there? I had $200 in my account. That's supernatural. At that same time, I was going. I had a $20 bill left at another incident, and I was going down to the, I don't know, it, was, it was like a food city, Kroger. Maybe it was a Kroger, I think. They're in Nashville, uh, down on Murfreesboro Road. And, I, and it was like, I'd gotten, you know, I'd, I forget why. It was like middle of the night. It was like something like 11 or 12. Was I think I had to work that night, but I owed money for something else. I had to give them. I only had like 20 bucks left, but I had enough to go get some groceries and go back home, get something to eat, go to bed, and get ready for the next day. I go in there. I buy my groceries. I'm coming back out to the, from, from the store, and I get up to the counter, put down $20 worth, counted it out, which back then $20 would really buy you something. <laughs> That's what a coffee and a bagel today, I think. I don't know. But anyway, and so, because this year, this is like 30-some years ago. So I got up there, and I was like, uh-oh. Um, 
can you give me just a minute? Can you hold the grocery? There, there wasn't anybody in there. It's like almost midnight. Can you just hold these groceries for a minute? I, I've got to go check on something. She said, sure. I walked down on the front porch. There's like one or two cars out in the parking lot, street lots, a few cars going by. And it's that childlike faith again. Like I said, I, I, I want to walk in that faith today. It's like sometimes it seems hard to do. But this was right after that salvation moment, you know, born again. And I was like, Lord, you promised you'd take care of me. And I did that whole tithing thing. And I had $20 and I, I need, I'm hungry tonight. You promised. And I remember standing there looking out there going, I, Lord, could you bring me my 20 or what do I do? I just stood there thinking God's going to do something. It, it was that kind of, you know, just he's going to do something. And so while I'm standing there waiting and praying, I was like, okay, Lord, well, you know, I watched this car pull in the parking lot off of Murfreesboro Road, drives all the way up to watch him. I'm watching this car the whole way because there's nobody else there. It comes right up to the front, a gremlin. You remember those gremlins? I think it was a gremlin or whatever. <laughs> so I know it couldn't have been an angel. Angels have to drive better cars than gremlins. <laughs> Pulled right up in front of me. I kid you not. Listen, the unbeliever would never believe this story, but you guys will. The guy gets out of the car over the top of the hood with a 20 and says, did you lose this? And I said, yes, I did. He said, well, I, here, there you go. I said, thank you. And he drove off. I went in to bought my groceries and went home. Now, I, I say these things. I, I didn't plan on sharing these stories tonight. I really didn't. And I was thinking, how are we going to get two chapters and, and spend the whole time? We're going to end early. I'm not, not with me, but either way. <laughs> All I'm saying is this. God taught me a very valuable lesson. Just believe his word. Just believe his word. You don't make too little not to tithe. He said, he said, and when we get to Malachi, you'll see he says this. He said, challenge me. Challenge me on this. Find out if I don't open the windows of heaven. And I'll tell you something, guys. From that lesson I learned as a baby Christian, and, and, and for a person who had very little skills other than playing music and no real craft skills to do whatever, God has blessed me beyond my wildest dreams financially over the years. He's not only covered all my bills, he gives me ice creams. <laughs> and I know why. He said, you take me at my word, I'll take care of you, I promised. He said, seek first the kingdom of God, all these things will be added. I'm telling you guys, I'm a testimony to it. They will be. So, he says, you put your wages, they're going away because you're not doing, you're not doing what you should be doing. Verse 7, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Here it is again, that kind of theme. Consider what you're doing. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You look for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Look, it says, God says, I took it away because you didn't honor me with it. Why, says the Lord of hosts? Because of my house that is in ruins while everyone runs to his own house. You're neglecting the things of God, in other words. Therefore, the heavens above you withhold, will withhold the dew. The earth withholds its fruit. For I called for a drought on the land and on the mountains and on the grain and the new wine and the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock and on all the labor of your hands. So I'm causing these problems that you're having. I'm the reason you're in financial trouble. I'm doing that on purpose. Because I'm trying to teach you about money is what he's saying. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the presence of the Lord. Now, obviously, Haggai had a reputation of being a real man of God or they wouldn't have done this, but again, you've got to love their heart. I mean, how many people, when they're not doing much right with God, have somebody stand up and say, this is what you need to do, and they go, I'm going to do that. There's very few. And these guys' hearts, they were in the right place. And then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people saying, I am with you, says the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. God stirred them because they were obeying. And they came and they worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. And so there it is again, these timestamps that God's giving uh, uh, to show the work that he was doing in the nation. Chapter 2, it says, now in the seventh month, on the 21st of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, the governor of Judah, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, who is left among you who saw the temple in its former glory? Now remember, when they were taken into Babylon, some of them were very, very young, kids. 
So although they were there 70 years, they'd now come back, they're probably in their 80s. The little ones, maybe some in their 90s that are still alive. So they remember the temple that was there before it got destroyed by Babylon. They, they remember the glory, right, of Solomon's temple. And now they're, they're saying, he's saying, who remembers that? There'd be very few, but there were some. He says, and how do you, that is those of you that remember it, how do you see it now? In comparison to it, is this not in your eyes as nothing? In other words, you know, it says when they were laying the foundation of this particular one and one of the other uh, uh, prophets, it says that the people were weeping because it was nothing compared to what Solomon's used to be. They were, this is, you know, we're never going to get the glory back that God gave us, and they're weeping. And, uh, and the young ones that had never seen it were cheering. We finally are getting their church, right? And the elders are going, that was nothing like the old church, you know, type thing. He says, yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. In other words, I'm going to do it, but you've got your part. And this is where that balance comes in, guys, the, the God doing it, but us doing our part. We have to step out and do stuff, right? But then God says, if you do it in obedience to me, then I'll bless it. He says, get busy. Consider your ways. Do what I'm calling you to do. For I'm with you, says the Lord. You're not alone, I'm here. According to the word that I uh, covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. I love it. Don't be afraid to obey me, even if it's challenging. My spirit's among you, and we have to trust that God is. You know, faith is, is, it's gotta be exercised. You know, the more you exercise faith, the older you get in the Lord, the more faith you're gonna have because it's like a muscle, it's a spiritual muscle. And so, you know, over the years being a pastor and getting to see these things where I was terrified, what's gonna happen? Oh God, we're all gonna die. You know, what's gonna happen, right? And then I see God come through. It's like that, a little bit more faith adds. And a little bit more faith adds, a little bit more faith adds. And it's like, it's to the point now to where there, there, I, there's nothing that can make me worry about what God would do here with the church, financially or whatever. If God wanted to close it, he'll close it. But if God don't wanna close it, there is no scenario that God will not come in and just do what he's gonna do. And I believe that now with all my heart, but that didn't happen on day one. And I'm not saying I'm some great man of faith. I still like faith a lot of times. Don't get me wrong. I'm saying it's a lot stronger than it was back when I first started working out. Start working out in your faith, spending time in the word, time in prayer. You're doing a few reps here, a few reps there, right? Start eating right, exercising your faith, taking that small step, maybe that first tithe, maybe that first Whatever, whatever it could be, I just whatever God calls you, and then and the, oh wow, he, he he really did do what he said he was going to do, and it's exciting. Wow, and then we begin to grow and trust, and so this is a growth thing that, that's happening. Thing, he said, "Don't be afraid. Trust me, for thus says the Lord of hosts: Once more, and it's a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land." Now he jumps to the very end of time. He's talking about the last days. I mean, he's talking about the great tribulation. And I'll, make, I'll shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. That's another term for Jesus Christ. The Messiah was called the desire of the nations. He said, I, and I, they shall come to the desire of nations, and I'll fill that temple with glory, or this temple that's going to happen in the future, with glory, says the Lord of hosts. In other words, there's, this temple may not seem like much to you, but there's going to be a temple built in the millennial kingdom that's going to be built, that's going to be so magnificent, Solomon's is going to look like a shack right? And the Messiah, the desire of nations is going to be there. And, and we're all going to go and get taught by him. He said, don't cry over this. It's you're, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. So like the guy that got buried with his fork, he really did. He wanted to get buried with a fork because he always said that his, his, his mom always told him, you know, hang on to your fork because there's dessert. The best is yet to come. And he said, I want to be buried with my fork because I know the best is yet to come. And they literally buried him with his fork. Isn't that great? But that's, that really should be the viewpoint of the believer. The best is yet to come. And that's what he's saying. Don't worry about what's happening right now. It's going to get so amazing. It's going to blow your mind. He says, the silver's mine. The gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple, the one I'm talking about in the millennial kingdom, shall be greater than the former. It's going to be greater than Solomon's by far, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I'll give peace, says the Lord of hosts. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Now ask the priest concerning the law, saying, If one carries holy meat, that is set aside, uh, you know, kosher, in the fold of his garment, with the edge uh, he touches bread or stew, wine or oil, any food, will, will that food, will it become holy? In other words, if I have holy meat and I touch something else, will it make that holy? And the priest said, No, just because you have holy something that's kosher and sanctified you touch something else it doesn't make that holy so then Haggai said well if one who is unclean because of a dead body 
somebody died around you or you had to go to a funeral, you're Levitically unclean for a certain amount of time. If that, if that person or thing touches any of these, will it be unclean? And the priest answered, yeah, it'll be unclean. So if you touch something that's unclean to other things, it makes them unclean. But if you have something holy and it touches unclean, it won't make it holy. So Haggai's going to make a point. And Haggai answered and said, so is this people. And so is the nation before me, says the Lord. And so is every work of their hands and what they offer and what they offer there is unclean. In other words, this is a picture of the people. Look, because you guys are walking holy with me, Zerubbabel, Joshua, if the people don't walk holy, you're not going to make them holy by hanging out with them. Okay, but if they're unclean, they can make you unclean by touching you Levitically, the law. It's a picture of in spirit. And again, a whole picture. I know he's talking about the people then that day, but what a picture that is for us of, you know, who we're hanging out with. We need to be hanging out with the unbeliever to reach them. But if we have friends we're just hanging out with that are living unholy lives, what he's saying is it's going to affect us and make us unholy in some ways. I still use it probably, maybe you haven't heard it. I haven't used it in a long time, but one of the best quotes I ever heard, Charles Stanley. He said, if you put on a white glove and put it down in mud, the mud does not become glovey. <laughs> Good point. He's making the same point. You know, holiness is something that you have to come to the Lord and say, God, cleanse me. But you can't, you know, if you're unclean, you're going to, again, influence other people in that uncleanness. And that's what the people were doing. He says, now carefully consider from this day forward. I love that. He gives a timestamp again. From this day forward, from before the stone was laid upon a stone in the temple of the Lord, since those days when one came to a heap of 20 ephahs, there were but 10. When you came to wine and vat and drew out 50 baths from the press, there was but 20. I struck you with blight and mildew and hell and all the labors of your hands. Yet you did not turn to me, says the Lord. God says, I made all these bad things happen to get your attention so you'd repent, but you wouldn't. So consider now from this day forward, watch what I'm going to do, because you've been obedient, because you've done what I've asked, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it, is the seed still in the barn? As yet the fig, as yet the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded, uh, not yielded fruit. But from this day, I will bless you. He's saying it's a marker from this day. Again, another story. And I've got to hurry. We just have a few minutes left. But when we bought this property, and we, were, we had like $380,000 to pay off, and we couldn't, we couldn't start the building until we paid that money off. And I was reading Haggai and reading this, and I'm saying, you know, Lord, he's saying, look, come on, build the temple. And I was like pleading with the Lord, I can't build it. I mean, I want to obey you, but I can't because we've got to pay the land off first. And, but I feel you in my spirit, you're saying, come on, let's go. Let's get building. Let's get moving. Let's start rocking, whatever. The land's got to be paid off first. And, of course, that was just to pay the land off. We didn't start the building right after that. And I'm sitting reading Haggai, and he said, like, from this day forward, I'll bless you. And I just, I was like, Lord, this, I don't know if that's for me or not, but you know what? If you want to, then let's, if this day forward, I believe it. I believe, Lord, that you can pay this off in no time, and we can get the land paid off, and then start making plans for the new building. And I kid you not, from that day, one year later, we paid that $380,000 off. In one year. Now, remember, we were a small church. We weren't the size we are now. That wouldn't be as impressive now, because God has, again, blessed the ministry. But back then, that three hundred eight thousand dollars to me, it might as well have been ten million. And God did it. I think God's had me share all these stories tonight. I never planned this. I think to help build your faith. I think this is a faith building night. I think that's what the Holy Spirit's doing is building faith tonight. I do, I do. And and I want you to know, at each of these phases that it happened, I wasn't a great man of faith. I don't want to. I don't want to falsely represent this because I've got to stand before the Lord. I mean, He's, He knows the truth. He's watching me right now. I, I didn't have great faith at all these things. I, I had faith. But it wasn't great faith. I had enough faith to say, okay, here we go. And that's all we need, isn't it? Mustard seed, just a little faith. But I think that God tonight's encouraging you guys to say, look, if I can do it for that guy, I can do it for anybody, right? He says, but from this day, I'll bless you. And again, the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, speaking, saying, speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth, and I will overthrow the, king, the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the, uh, the chariots. And those who ride in them, the horses and their riders, shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Sheltiel, says the Lord, and make you like a signet ring. That is, they would use the signet to mash into the, their, their seal or whatever to represent who it was. For I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. So he goes, look, all this is going to happen, but I'm going to use you to finish the temple. You're going to do a great work. And when we get into Zechariah here, um, next time we get into Zechariah, the very first there, get into chapter 4, naturally says, you know what? You laid the foundation, Zerubbabel, and you're going to finish it. 
So God gave Zerubbabel that promise, and so God's going to carry that promise out, and we'll see that when we get into the book of Zechariah. But as we wrap this up, guys, I want to pray for us as we finish. Again, I think this was a night unexpected. I didn't, I didn't expect, I had none of these stories planned. Of course, I know them. They're my life, but I mean, I didn't plan to share these. Um, and at the same time, I felt this is where God led it. And I think that truly the spirit is working tonight because he wants to grow our faith. All of us. We're all at different places in our faith. And God wants to grow it. You look, you know, Abraham didn't start out where he could take his son and make him a sacrifice. That was 25 years after he had his son. It's a long time of faith building. To where God says, now I'm going to ask you to do some hard things. Some of you are right at the beginning of your journey. You're just trying to have some baby steps like we talked about early on in the teaching. You're just trying to learn to be faithful in certain areas. That's, and that's okay. That's kind of the, the beginning of learning faith. Some of you have gone so far down the road. Now God's asking you to do something that seems so far beyond you. You could never, God, that can't be you. And God's saying, it is me. I want you to step out and watch what I do. And so wherever you are, again, the Bible says operate in the faith that you have. Don't be presumptuous, don't be foolish, but operate in the faith you have. And I think tonight was a night of encouragement and faith building. So when we finish now, I want to pray that God will continue to grow our faith wherever we are in our walk, that we would all grow together and have greater faith because we're going to need greater faith in the days that are ahead, are we not? So let's pray for that right now. Let's finish up. Father, I thank you, Lord, for just your amazing word tonight in Haggai. What a tremendous um, a book, Lord. What a just, again, short but powerful, like all of your word. And Lord, again, I just pray, this is really a night of faith. I, I, I truly believe that's what it was designed. I didn't know you had that design, but Lord, you surprised me, but I think it was a knot of faith. So again, your church, you can do what you want. You know what we need. That's what we needed tonight. So build our faith. I pray right now for those in this room, no matter where they are in their walk in faith, God, build it. Help them to be brave, to step out. If it's a baby step, to take that first baby step. If it's jumping over a canyon, they think they can't really jump over, but they're hearing your voice saying, you'll make it then let them be bold. Get that run and go and make that leap and watch you intervene in power with wind under their wings. What a great God you are, Lord. Just do your work. I know you are. Encourage your flock. Let the seeds that are planted tonight, Lord, grow in your people and use them in greater and greater ways. I think you're going to raise up greater warriors for the days that we have ahead, God. And I thank you, Lord, for the honor to get to serve side by side with you and with all these in the family of God. What a blessing it is. So we thank you, Lord, we give you praise, and we bless your name and ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I asked you all to do two songs because I thought I'd finish.